So let's go ahead and get started. And I want to share a lot of information with you tonight, but there's one key concept that I want you to consider as we talk about this, because this is really important for treating neck conditions, shoulder conditions, pain in general, for treating the hips and the low back, and for structural conditions. And when there's misalignments that are present, this is essential information to know and understand, okay? So this treatment principle, it really involves understanding working with antagonistic muscles. So we know that there's antagonists and a simple example of this is the bicep and the tricep. So when the bicep contracts, the tricep lengthens, okay? And we've got these antagonistic muscle groups all over our body. Now, what I want to um, introduce you to though is that it's really helpful to think of these myofascial lines in a similar way, okay? So for instance, if this, superficial front line here, which looks a lot like the stomach meridian, if that thing contracts, which is very common for desk workers or for anyone that's hunched over, it's causing contractions in these muscle groups, okay? And that's occurring through the whole line as well. If you're seated in a chair and working at a desk all day, it's going to contract the hip flexors. And one of the hip flexors is the rectus femoris, which is part of the superficial front line. Okay. And it's also going to cause the head to shift forward and down often when people are sitting at screens, that's going to contract the SCM. Okay. So when that happens, it will also um, have the opposite effect on the back lines, which is going to over lengthen those. Okay. So the antagonistic muscles that we've probably learned about in school a long time ago and that we're familiar with, we can apply that similar way of thinking to these fascial lines. And it's really helpful to do that because it'll help you to understand some of the functional anatomy and how to make better point prescriptions, and you're going to see better results with all types of conditions, okay? Now, sometimes people think that the way that I speak about this, it may only apply to musculoskeletal conditions or to pain, but these principles actually apply to internal medicine as well, and I have a whole class on internal medicine, and we may get into some of that tonight as well. Um, so if there's contractions or tightness in some of the ligaments or some of the fascia that surrounds the viscera, you can still get tightness occurring in one ligament, and then that's going to stretch on some of the other areas of the body as well. So this doesn't just apply to musculoskeletal dynamics, but you can apply it to abdominal diagnosis and internal medicine as well. And when we're speaking about this in these terms, then it's helpful to think of this as mechanical energy, okay? So I like to draw comparisons and, and build the bridge between Eastern and Western medicine because there's been a lot of research done on acupuncture. And when we understand some of that, it can really give us great insights into how to refine our treatment strategies. And it doesn't mean that we need to do away with our traditional way of thinking, that still applies, but if we can find the sweet spot where uh, modern medicine and modern research and the myofascial lines meet our traditional concepts, then that's the sweet spot. And that's how we get the best results is when we integrate the two. And that's just really a yin yang dynamic. Okay. So, okay. We've got the superficial back line here, which you can see it includes these muscle groups. I'm not going to cover a lot of this anatomy right now because I want to get into deeper level stuff, okay? And a lot of you are probably familiar with this already, or it's easily accessible to find out what muscles are on these lines. So we can see that this superficial back line, it includes these muscles, including the erector spinae, the occipital fascia, the posterior sacral fascia, the hamstrings, the calves, and the Achilles tendon, okay? It looks a lot like the urinary bladder meridian. And we've got the superficial front line here, the lateral line looking like the gallbladder meridian, the deep front line, which is really essentially a nice way to think about the leg yin channels. Okay, so one uh, tip I want to give you now is that start thinking of the three leg yin channels as basically being one line, and that's the deep front line. Because if we look at the functions and the indications of these points, even from a traditional perspective, we do find that there's a lot of overlap. 
For instance, liver three is commonly used for gynecological conditions, as are other liver points. Liver eight, they're often used for calming the mind and for treating shin disturbance as well. And the same can be said for a point like spleen six or other spleen points. You know, spleen six is known for uh, calming the shin. This deep front line, it's hard to see here, but it includes the tibialis posterior muscle here. And essentially, you can reach that through needling the legion points. But when you're up in the area of the tibia, you have to make sure that you get the right needle angle if you're going to get into that deep front line. If you needle at the wrong angle, you can just put the needle in the gastrocnemius muscle, and then that's going to be affecting the superficial back line. So you got to make sure that you get the right angle and you want to needle into that tibialis posterior muscle. Okay. So this is a really key thing for helping to get better results when you're doing your needling too, is that when you understand, when you understand these muscles and what muscles are on which line, it helps you to better understand what angle you need to take with your needle if you're going to reach that. Because all too often we can put a needle in and not get the right depth or not get the right angle. And then it's not going to have the desired effect that we want. Okay. So that's a really key reason to understand the anatomy is because then you're going to get your angles and your depths right. You know, so if you needle points like spleen six or spleen seven or any of those points along the medial side of the tibia and you don't go deep enough or you don't get the right angle then you're going to miss having that effect and i see this all the time where people aren't getting the right needle depth and angle and just through understanding the anatomy then it's going to help you to get that right okay so as i was saying this deep front line then it's the leg yen meridians here. And we've noticed that there's a lot of similarity then between all the points on the leg yen channels because they're all going to be affecting this deep front line. You know, you can use kidney points and liver points and spleen points. What do we use those for primarily? We use them for gynecological conditions, reproductive conditions. We use them for urinary conditions. And it's because it's affecting these deep fascia here in the pelvis, but also up into the diaphragm. The diaphragm is on the deep front line. And so, you know, we can often use liver points for treating lung conditions. And it's that liver overacting on the lungs or the liver chi is stagnant and it's constraining the lung function. And then that's that um, lung liver relationship that we speak of. It's the system five connection in Tons systems. Now, the pericardium is also on this deep front line. And this is that Jui Yin relationship then between the pericardium and the liver. And so the pericardium is a part of this deep front line. And we also recognize the relationship between the kidneys and the heart, right? That's the Xiao Yin connection. And then the connection between the spleen and the heart. And that's that connection on the Harari cycle, okay? Where they're next to each other on the clock. That's the, what is that? The system four connection, okay? So we find that we can use a lot of these points, not just the ones we commonly think of, like we might use liver three for heart conditions, or patterns, and we might use spleen six as well, but we can also use those other points on that line because it's affecting the deep front line. And sometimes it is more advantageous to use points that are higher up, okay, rather than the more distal ones. And understanding these lines will also help you to better understand when you should be doing distal needling and when you want to do more local needling. Now, I mostly do distal needling, but um, you can get a lot of insights about when to use what needling technique when you understand these lines and when you account for people's unique anatomy in their body type. Okay. Now, this back functional line right here, this is a really cool line because it shows that the latissimus is a part of this as well as the glutes. And then this is vastus lateralis here. Okay. And this actually explains why points on the hand are so effective for treating low back pain. So we use like lingu, dabai, shabai. Let's look at that here. Now, 
this is the superficial back arm line that you see here. And those points like Lingu and Dabai and Shabai that we use for treating low back pain, they are working in part because of the connection between um, this line and the way in which the latissimus connects there. So see how the lats attach to the humerus right there. So many points on the on the superficial back arm line are used for treating lumbar pain and low back pain. You know, we've got Yao Tang Shui, and that can be effective for it. Uh, we can use San Jiao 5 for it. We can use the points 33.08 and 33.09 in the Master Dong system. You can use those for hip pain and lumbar pain, and those are all right here on this line, and they're working in a mechanical way because of this connection that the lats have to the arms, okay? So when we start to think about biomechanics and the functional anatomy, then a lot of things will start to click into place in understanding how these points work in a very physical and anatomical way, okay? So I hope that you got that. I usually don't share that in the free webinars like this, but I just want to give you some extra information. I'm feeling generous tonight and I wanna share as much as I can in this hour. So um, in my courses, I've got a total of like 50 hours of material and four or five of them. So I'll share everything I can right now. Okay, what class are we looking at here? This is the neck, back and shoulder class, okay? A common thing that we treat. And one thing that I want you to consider too, this. The master dung numbering system is really unique and it can be confusing to people just learning it, but it doesn't have to be. And if you consider the ways that these points are numbered, it's really quite brilliant because think of this in terms of different regions, okay? The 22 point XX points are the points on the hand and then the points with the 11 prefix are the points on the fingers and then the points with the 33 prefix or here in the forearm, okay? But different points within these different regions will have different effects. So, you know, you can needle points on the hand and get a really powerful effect for treating low back pain, but the points on the fingers, they're not so powerful for that unless it's a condition like arthritis or the bones are involved because this is a really bony area. And we have traditional ways that kind of relate to that as well, okay? Now, some of the strongest points we know are these points that are on the hand or on the feet or in the more distal part of the legs and the arms. And here we have something what I call neuromuscular convergence occurring, where you've got the nerves converging and being very dense in the areas of the hands and the feet. That's why they're so sensitive. But we also have the fascia converging as well in these areas. And if we look at these lines, we can see this is the superficial back line. It's converging in the area of the ankles. And all of these lines are doing that basically. So look at this line. It's converging here in the area of like GB39 and GB40. And so we've got this neuromuscular convergence going on. And when you understand that, it helps us to know when we should needle those points and when we shouldn't needle those points, okay? For clients that are really super needle sensitive, I suggest like starting with more proximal points, come up here higher, because we don't wanna overwhelm those really sensitive patients. But for those that are okay with the needles and they respond well, you're gonna get your most powerful results around the wrists and around the ankles and at these distal locations and on the hands and the feet because you're getting a strong reaction with the dechi or with the nerves and with these myofascial lines as well. Okay, so one treatment principle that we have in both TCM and in the balance method and TON systems is that we can use one end of the meridian to affect the other end of the meridian. So for instance, if we look at the lateral line and the gallbladder meridian, we know that we can use points like gallbladder 39 
or in the Dong system, we can use um, like the seven tigers are in this area as well. We can use those points for treating areas like GB20 or GB21, or we can use it for like scapular area pain as well um, when it's on the seven tigers, that is. So when we needle one end of the line, it affects the other end of the line. And we know this from our traditional practices. But when you understand the myofascial anatomy and exactly what muscles are involved and on that line, then it's going to get you better results. Because you can needle points like uh, the seven tigers. And if you know what muscle you're needling into when you needle those points, so from the area of like UB58 to UB60, it's going to have certain effects up here. But if you don't get it in the right muscle and you don't understand what muscles are on which line, then you're, you're kind of like throwing darts at a dartboard and you're only using one eye or you're not quite seeing the whole picture. So just by understanding the anatomy, it's going to help you to better understand so many of the point functions, okay? Okay, so in the 212 class, this is what I see is one of the major areas of weakness that a lot of acupuncturists have, and something that physical therapists and osteopaths and other doctors understand. And this has to do with structure and alignment. Okay, so these are some actual case studies from the 212 class on the neck and shoulders. And notice how his shoulders aren't level. Okay. And you'll have a lot of patients out there where they have pain at GB21 and their shoulders aren't level. Okay, see how that guy's shoulders are tilted. So in the 212 class, and right now I'm gonna share it with you, there's four things that you gotta look for when you're dealing with neck, back, shoulder pain and hip conditions and um, lumbar pain, any type of pain, any type of musculoskeletal pain you need to understand these four fundamentals. And really it's only three. You can just learn three of these and it's gonna transform your practice. And these are tilt, bend, rotation, and shift, okay? So if you have a client with pain, you know, he had shoulder pain. It was more of a, um, I think it was lateral and anterior shoulder pain in, in the back as well. But um, so when you understand that, the shoulders are tilted then, and you see that there's a structural issue there, it's going to help you to choose your points better as well. And when you understand the way that the muscles are involved in this, you know, this could be due to uh, a trapezius being contracted, you know, and often that's the case, but it's not the only situation. It might be a situation where the levator scapulae here is more involved, okay? So both of those muscles are gonna be involved in elevating the shoulders. The trapezius can be, or, and that would be, you know, pain at GB21, but it may be that the root of the problem is not in the trapezius, but it's more in this area of small intestine 13. And then maybe they have pain in the upper cervical where the levator attaches. So in this class, and you know what I'm sharing tonight is when you understand the way that these muscles connect and where they connect and where they insert, then you're going to be able to choose points better because I know, you know, it's common that we have some favorite points that we use and they work really well. And maybe it's the points here on the hand for low back pain. And, you know, they can be effective for, you know, Dr. Tan would say that they're effective for 80% of cases for low back pain. And, you know, they are often very effective, but for some clients, those points, they don't reach the lower back. They are not going to reach the deeper levels, okay? They're not going to reach the anterior sacral fascia. They're not going to reach the erector spinae so well, but other points can. So when you understand, you know, that, oh, the low back pain is coming because of a problem in these paraspinals or in the sacral, posterior sacral fascia, then those points on the hand probably won't work so well. Now, they will if 
the the laps are also in pain but um, if you do those hand points and they don't work then you can start to look at using urinary bladder points or you can also use deep front line points we know that a lot of the leg yin meridians are used for low back pain um, but they're going to get to a whole different level. They're going to get more to the anterior sacral fascia. They're going to get more into the pelvis, okay? So this stuff is really, really incredible. It can really transform the way that you're practicing and get you better results straight away, okay? So when I'm looking at a client like this, I'm not just thinking about his shoulders being elevated and there's pain at GB21. He might have pain at GB21, but that may not be the root of the problem, okay? The root may be at the levator scapulae like we talked about, or in his case, he also had this anterior shift. Okay. So a shift is one of the four terms I want you to learn tonight too. Okay. There's tilts, there's bends, there's rotations and shifts. So a tilt is when I'll just read from the notes here. It says it leans to one side, making one side higher than the other. Okay. So you can have head tilts towards one shoulder or shoulder tilts. So this is an example of a shoulder tilt here. But see how he also has a head tilt, how his head's like this. So we've got a head tilt, and then the shoulders are tilted as well. Okay. Now, on this side, this side's going to be more contracted here. If I tilt my head this way, it's causing contraction. The muscles on this side are contracting, and then these are getting over lengthened or strained. Okay, and this goes back to that original principle that I want you to learn tonight and reflect on is that because of these antagonistic um, muscle groups, when one contracts, the other one is going to lengthen. Okay, now often this is a key point. Take your notes out, get this point down. This is so essential to understand. Okay, often we think of pain existing where there's contractions such as with this guy, if he had pain at GB21, we might think, oh, there's a trigger point at GB21. And I think why people think this way is they associate pain with muscle contractions is because of trigger points. And we know that trigger points are these little miniature muscle contractions that exist. However, there's more going on than just that, okay? And I believe that some of the time why these trigger points develop is not because the muscle as a whole is in contraction, but because the muscles actually being over lengthened and strained. And so as a compensatory, compensatory mechanism, some of the muscles are going to contract to restore the balance. So for instance, if I'm sitting in a desk like this all day, okay, my superficial front line is contracted. Okay, so my SCM is contracting, my anterior neck muscles are contracting, my sternum and abdominal muscles are contracting forward, and my hip flexors, uh, and the rectus femoris, the psoas, they're all contracted. Okay, so we got contraction down this whole line. Now, what happens though, for your clients that are sitting at desks all day, where do they get their pain at? They don't get it in the anterior part. Not usually, they don't get it in, they might get it in the hip flexors a little bit, but generally, if we're just talking about the neck, back and shoulders and the upper back, that is, they're going to get the pain here in uh, the upper back and the upper neck. And it's those muscles there that are getting over lengthened and stretched. Okay. So if I forward bend like that at a desk, or if I forward bend in yoga, this line is contracting and this one is over lengthened. So oftentimes where people feel the pain is where there's strain, where there's pull, where the muscles are over lengthened, okay? Physical therapists understand this. This is something that we need to understand as well. And I was reading some research articles, um, it was a number of months ago, but they were talking about how they were doing a study comparing where people feel pain more, where in the areas of contraction, or if they feel pain more in the antagonistic muscles that are strained. And it came out, I think the number was like 64% of the conditions that they looked at 
there was excess strain. So the pain was occurring where the muscles were being over lengthened. Okay. So that's that key principle that I want you to learn is when they have pain, often it's due to strain and not contraction. Okay. And there's, you need to, you need to recognize that and then um, needle it appropriately. Because if someone back to the GB21 example, if I'm like this all day long and I'm getting pain in my upper back and you put needles in it, in the area of pain, you're putting it in an area that's already weak. So what the physical therapists do is uh, they will release the areas of contraction, but then we need to strengthen those areas that are lengthened, okay? So think of this like the uh, a workout, okay? If you go into a gym and you lift weights, we're focusing on contracting the muscles and making them short, and that causes muscles to get big and strong, right? But if you go to yoga and you're doing yoga, the focus is on stretching and making the muscles flexible, okay? So that doesn't strengthen the muscles, okay? Stretching, being limber, it doesn't strengthen the muscles. It makes them flexible. So in these types of clients, and what the physical therapists do is they recognize that those muscles that are over lengthened and in strain, they need to be strengthened, okay? So if you're just putting needles in an area where they feel pain and it's strained, it's probably not gonna give you the best result because those muscles need to become stronger, okay? All right, so I hope that's not too difficult to understand. I know this is complex at times, but if we just take it back to the yin-yang dynamic, then it gets easier to understand. Let's see. Let's go back to these four terms, okay? Because this is something that is also related to this principle of working with the antagonistic contraction and strains that exist. So we've got tilts. We've talked about that, how one side's higher than the other. Okay. We often see this in the shoulders and in the head. Watch today when you're in clinic, watch for that. You're going to see it, it happens all the time. And then we've got bends. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but bends are a series of tilts that result in a curve. It's usually applied to the spine and for a condition like scoliosis. I'm not going to go into that right now because I want to speak about these other two and they're more relevant for where I want to take the discussion. So a rotation is a rotation of a structure in a circular plane. So it's really simple. If I rotate my head this way, then that's a rotation. And this is a really important concept to understand when you're treating the hips, okay? Because people will often have external rotations where the foot points out. So one of the first things I check when I'm treating the hips is I'll have the person walk down the hall or across the room and then just stop at some point. And I want to see how their feet are positioned. You know, they should be straight. But if a foot is pointing out like that, then that indicates that there is an external rotation. And that can be in the femur um, or that can be in the foot. We want to identify where that external rotation is coming from. So for people with hip pain, they'll often have either an external or an internal rotation going on, okay? So important thing to look for when you're treating the hips. And also for neck pain too, you know, rotations of the head are often very common as well. And let's see, um, I got a picture here where it shows a bit. You can kind of see this guy's head's rotated just slightly. And you'll observe this in clinic all the time where there's this slight rotation, but it looks as if his um, shoulder is also rotated. So you can have a rotation in the head that looks like this. These muscles are going to contract. These are going to over lengthen. They're probably going to get pain on the side, which is over lengthened. Okay. Now the shoulders can also rotate. So when you're treating the hips or the shoulders and you're working with that dynamic, between the shoulders and the hips, then um, you need to check the shoulders to see if they're rotated relative to the hips, okay? So these things, I know we're not used to thinking about structure and alignment. A lot of acupuncturists aren't at least, and 
I tried to think about it for many, many years and I just couldn't grasp structure and alignment. I worked with chiropractors. I shared office space with them. We'd go out to lunch. We'd discuss cases. We were sharing clients and, you know, referring clients. We worked in the same office. It took me forever to understand structure and alignment. But what finally did it is understanding these myofascial lines and understanding these three terms, basically, just tilt, rotation, shifts, and bends. Okay, that's all you got to learn. And it's really simple. Here's an example of the last one is a shift. Okay, so let me just read the definition of a shift. A shift is a general term for displacements from the center of gravity. Okay, so the center of gravity, we can speak about the spine and the torso being the center of gravity, they should be lined up. But in a shift, we see this movement off of that center of gravity. So you've probably seen how massage therapists and other uh, structural therapists will like to look at this relationship between the ear and the shoulder, and they should line up. But you can see how her ear is forward of her shoulder. So that's an example of an anterior head shift. Now, this guy, this case study here, he had a whole anterior shift going on in his torso. He was walking around like this, and it was quite incredible to see that. And um, it was related to the symptoms that he felt. So the way I treated that with him is I just taught him to do some really simple back bends, like some upward dogs, the cobra pose, the camel pose, and some seated back bends as well. And those positions then they help to restore that forward shift that was occurring in his torso. So when you understand these basic elements of how to assess people's structure and you know how to look for tilts and shifts and rotations, that's going to greatly improve upon the way that you make your point selections, especially for these musculoskeletal conditions and anything where there's misalignments and structural disorders that are present. So this is something that you can very easily add to your skill sets and in order to understand how to do this, Knowing the myofascial lines will greatly assist you in so many ways and open up that whole realm of being able to competently treat structural disorders. Okay, let's look at a few more things here. So we've spoke already about how too much sitting can cause contraction in the superficial front line and then that will strain or over lengthen this back line and often leads to pain in the back rather than in the front line where the contraction's occurring at. And you can see these all over in a lot of different cases, not only in the neck and the upper back and the shoulders, but this will also happen in the groin and in the hips and is also related to internal and external rotations in the femur or the foot. So these are just really simple movements that you can learn to do. And we'll take a look at the hips in just a moment and speak more about that but I want to show you around a little bit more in the course as well in the neck back and shoulders course so here we see some of the key points on the hand that we can use and these points are on the superficial back arm line and these are widely used for spinal neck back and shoulder conditions so when we do any of these points in the hand here that you see, it's going to have an effect on this whole line and it's going to affect the deltoids, it's going to affect the trapezius, and it's going to affect other lines as well because of the way in which the meridians and the fascia lines connect to other meridians and fascia lines. One thing that I do in the course is I compare the traditional meeting points that we speak of with the anatomy of these fascial lines. And we see many cases where these two ideas line up, where the traditional ideas of the meeting points line up with actual anatomical meeting points that exist in these fascial lines. I also explore this in the context of the traditional meridian connection. So for instance, GB21 is right here at the top of the trapezius. But we recognize this connection between the San Zhao meridian and the gallbladder meridian, and we refer to that as the Xiaoyang connection. 
Now, for paying at GB21, one method that you can use is to do opposite side Sanjiao 3 and Sanjiao 5. And that can be a pretty effective treatment for pain at GB21. But we can also do it on the same side, and sometimes that will be more effective as well. So in Dr. Tan's systems, he would teach that in system one, you needle on the opposite side, and in system two or four, you can needle on the same or opposite side, and system three, you needle on the opposite side. So if you're not familiar with the balance method, this is just a way to determine whether we should needle points on the same side as the pain or the symptoms or on the opposite side. And in the traditional teachings, we will frequently needle on the opposite side and then less frequently we'll needle on the same side. But knowing how to choose same side or opposite side treatment protocols is in the TON system and the balance method. It's kind of theoretical because it's based on these meridian connections. But when you understand the anatomy of these meridian connections and you understand how needling points on this hand is going to affect this whole line, then we can actually do a point combination like Sanjiao 3 and Sanjiao 5 on the same side as GB21 and get a good result with it. You can also needle the opposite side, but I think you can see from this diagram how needling the Sanjiao points on the same side as GB21 is essentially the same as needling the meridian points on the same side like a system six connection. So for instance, if you have a client with pain at stomach 25 and in the stomach meridian, you can needle the same side stomach 36 and stomach 37 stomach points because it's on the stomach meridian so we needle the same side. Well it's a similar type of thing here. We can apply this to the myofascial line. So for pain at GB21 we can needle points like Sanjiao 3 and Sanjiao 5 or even Luo Jin or 22.03 and 22.06 because it's affecting that line on the same side. Okay? Now that's not always going to give you the best result with GB21 though, especially if the condition is due to an anterior head shift. So let's go back to that. We'll look at this different diagram. She's also got an anterior shift going on here. Now, a person with this type of posture is likely going to have pain through this area and into the upper back and perhaps even at GB21. So. If you needle Sanjiao 3 and Sanjiao 5 on one client and get a great result, then that's awesome. We love to have that. But if that doesn't happen, the root cause may be in an anterior shift in the head as well. Okay, and that's causing extra strain and it's pulling on that trapezius. So unless you design your needle protocols to address this anterior head shift and the contraction in the superficial front line there, then you're not going to see results. And you'll also have to teach your client some basic postural techniques so that they can restore their posture and get their head back on top of their shoulders in a way that lines up. Okay, so knowing those three terms, the tilt, the shift, and the rotations and looking for those is going to greatly assist you in understanding why point selections sometimes work and why they don't sometimes. So in the 212 class and the 214 class, I go into a lot of detail about how this relates to conditions of the neck, back, shoulders, upper back, low back, and the hips and pelvis as well. All right. So I think that's about everything. Let me just take a few looks here. So I go through each of the points and discuss when to use the finger points because some of the finger points are indicated for neck, back, and spinal conditions, but a lot of times they won't work. But for some things, you should definitely be using them. I like to use them for conditions where the bones are involved, such as arthritis, or if the nerves are involved because there's a lot of sensitivity and nerve endings in the fingertips. And I also like them for degeneration. So I go more into that, but those finger points, 
I don't use them as primary points for treating back and spinal conditions because you get a stronger result with the hand points, but for conditions where the bones are involved, such as arthritis, or if the nerves are involved, if they're getting nerve tingling into their fingertips or degeneration, then I would use those, okay? I elaborate much more on that in the class, but I'll just leave it at that for now. I also talk about point combinations and how to combine points and some different things that can help you to get a better result with that. The class is full of these excellent diagrams. You can see I do a really thorough discussion of 33.08 and 33.09, which I love these points, and these are points that you're probably not using very often in clinic, but these are great points to use for lumbar, hip, and pelvic conditions. And this is a master dung point combination. These points are on the San Jiao line, and they're up near the elbow and a little off the San Jiao meridian towards the ulna. So you can see that with these illustrations, I provide a lot of details about what muscles they're in and what lines they're on, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let me show you around the hips course a bit. So one of the first things I talk about is some of the common points for hip pain, and I've listed all of the TCM points that we use as well as the master dung points for the hips. And I'm always comparing the master dung points to the TCM points because there's a lot of overlap. And when you understand these myofascial lines, learning the master dung points isn't going to be so difficult because you'll be better able to see how these points relate to the regular meridians and then how they relate to the myofascial lines. So bringing these three things together, dung's points, TCM points, and then the fascial lines, it just makes things click so that you can really better comprehend the point functions and indications and when to use one group over the other and how they affect the myofascial lines. Okay, so I discussed some of the common points for hip pain and then I also talk about some of the points for groin pain because the groin is essentially a part of the hips and the pelvis and it's important to consider what's going on there, especially when you start to notice either internal or external rotations in the femur or in the leg. And I compare this with the dong style points for groin pain. I also talk about treatment principles as well that are including traditional treatment principles and methods as well as treatment principles that are based on the anatomy of these lines, such as the primary treatment principle that I wanted to introduce tonight, which has to do with understanding antagonistic muscles, okay? So there's a case study in here that really helps to demonstrate that. Um, I'll show you that in just a moment. So here's some of the dung points for hip pain. And uh, a group of points on the deltoid can be used for treating hip pains in the dung system. And these are what are known as the shoulder vertical three needles. So if you go right in the middle of the deltoid, that point's known as Jen Jong, and then you go Tucson distal and Tucson proximal, so Tucson up and Tucson down from that center point, you can use those three points for treating hip conditions. James Marr speaks about this. And then there's also a, another shoulder triplet combination, which is LI-15, which is up here higher, and then Jen Chen and Jen Ho, which are just forward and posterior to that, and needling into the joint. So I discuss these different point combinations and when to use one combination over the other. And we can see from this picture here of this back functional line. Remember how we discussed the lats attach to the humerus. And when you needle points in the deltoid, because of this close proximity of the lats and the deltoid, because the lats are gonna be attaching right in here, just in this area where this lower point is located, these points then in the deltoid are gonna affect this back functional line and can help to treat the pain, especially when it's in the area of GB30 and in the glutes. Now, if it's a joint condition and let's say that, that it's like bursitis of the hip and it's something deeper in the joint, you're gonna be better off needling the points 
like LI15 and Jin Chen and Jin Huo, because we can insert those into the shoulder joint. And when you put that needle in the shoulder joint, then it's going to have that deeper effect on the joints, not only in the shoulder, but also in the hip. Okay. So I discuss all that in great detail. We also go into differential diagnosis within Western medicine and compare that to TCM methods. And there's a lot you can learn about that. Uh, there's also a case study or a research study in here about one of the university hospitals did some research on treating hip pain. And I think that was an arthritis condition. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, so here's the stuff where I look at some of the Western methods and differential diagnosis according to uh, Western medicine. One way that they do this then in a differential diagnosis in Western medicine is they'll subdivide it into three areas. You've got the anterior hip and then the lateral hip and the posterior hip. And when you do that, it's similar to what we do in Chinese medicine and in uh, the balance method in, in the Dong system where we identify what meridians are involved. So for anterior hip pain, then that's going to involve often the stomach meridian and the anterior hip, whereas lateral hip pain is going to involve the lateral line or the gallbladder meridian, and then the posterior area will often involve things like the sacroiliac joint or the urinary bladder meridian. And so I do go into more of a discussion about this and then how this relates to different point selections that you can use for treating the hip and the pelvis. And here's what I was looking for. It was osteoarthritis of the hip. So there's a discussion in here about this research that was done for treating osteoarthritis of the hip. And I've drawn from several sources. And this is something that, you know, a lot of older women will get this. And there is, it's a difficult condition to treat. But when you understand these principles that I'm teaching and when you understand how to look for internal and external rotations and when you understand where the pain is at according to a differential diagnosis and you understand what lines and what myofascial lines are going to best reach that area, then you're going to start to see better results with that. So here's the research review that I was looking for. So this was called Acupuncture Provides Short-Term Pain Relief for Patients in a Total Joint Replacement Program. So I go into discussions about what the research has shown and treatment methods that they used, as well as how we can improvise on that and improve the point selections from these sort of standard point prescriptions that they'll use in the research. Okay, so section three of the course, it talks a lot about hip anatomy and functional movements. So to get good results when treating the hips and even the low back, the low back is generally easier to treat, but in getting good results with treating hip pain and hip disorders, then it really is beneficial to understand the anatomy more. So in the course, I go through the hip muscles in the anterior region and what muscles are involved in hip flexion, which ones are involved in hip extension, which ones are involved in abduction and adduction. So once you understand these basic movements of the hip, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and the rotations, and you understand what muscles are involved and what myofascial lines are involved, then you're gonna know how to make good point selections, okay? And there's often contrary things that happen in the hip that make it, that make getting good results with it. And there's often contrary things that happen in the hip that make it more difficult to treat. And by contrary, what I mean is what you may think is a good way to approach it, we actually want to do the opposite. And this has to do with the antagonistic muscle groups. So for instance, when the 
hip rotators, the external rotators, contract. You can get chronic contraction in the external rotators, okay? And the pain may not be there in that area. The pain may actually be in the groin for a situation like that. So if you're doing liver points to treat the pain in the groin, you may not get a good result because it's not releasing the chronic contractions that exist in the external rotators, okay? So the problem may not actually be in the liver meridian or the deep front line. The root problem is not there. The root problem is where the chronic contractions are at, but they may not feel pain where the chronic contractions at. It's the same like we discussed with the neck in an interior head shift. If someone's head is shifted forward, then the muscles in the anterior part of the neck are contracting and the superficial front line is contracting, but they're feeling pain in the back. So if you put points in the front of the neck, it's not necessarily going to produce a result. Oftentimes it won't produce any results at all because the pain is in the area where there's chronic pull and chronic strain may feel pain in the groin, but the root problem is in the external rotators because they're in a state of chronic contraction. And if you needle the liver meridian then, and you're doing like a system six method and you're needling the liver meridian on the same side as the pain because the pain's in the groin, a lot of times you're just not gonna get a result with that because the problem is in the area where the chronic contractions are at in the external hip rotators. So what you'll need to do in a situation like that is release that chronic contraction in the external rotators and you can do that by needling the lateral line or the gallbladder meridian. Okay, so that goes back to that principle that I've been discussing all along where we got to understand the antagonistic muscle groups and we want to reduce that chronic contraction to treat the antagonistic muscles or the antagonistic line where the pain or the symptoms is at. Okay, if you can just master that principle and understand that the pain is often where there is excess lengthening and excess strain in the muscles, and if you can identify where that chronic contraction is at, then it's gonna take you to the whole new level of getting results. Now, the other thing that you gotta understand about this too is that there's these different levels of myofascial lines. There's the superficial lines, and then there's the deep lines. And oftentimes, we may mistake symptoms or pain at one level so we may think that the pain is at GB30 and at the superficial level, so the glutes, the gluteus maximus is at a superficial level, but there's also these deeper level muscles as well. So you need to make sure that you're doing your needle technique and choosing your points and getting to those proper muscle groups where the contractions are at because it may look like the pain is at the superficial level, but it's really at the deep level, okay? So understanding the anatomy and the functional anatomy of the hips and the back and the neck and the shoulders, it's going to give you those additional insights about where the root problem is at. And if you do your first group of points and it doesn't work, then you're going to know how to proceed to the next group of points to reach a whole different level or a whole different myofascial line, okay? So I hope that's clear enough. There's a lot of examples that I could give and there's more examples in the class. Another thing that I discuss in this is the different muscles that are involved in like hip flexion. Here we see the hip flexors and I discuss that. I also talk about the hip extensors and this move here that this woman's doing shows the hips and extension. So we go into all the detail about the functional anatomy in this course. And then let me show you one more. We talk about what points are on different lines. So here we have the hip abductors and there's primary hip abductors and secondary muscles that we talk about. And then we discuss the master dung points that are on the lateral line. So this point here in red is 
in the middle that's um, in the dung system these three points are used together they're called phi nine miles three but this is gb31 the red point in the center so there's three different point groups that you can use here that are associated with the lateral line the gallbladder meridian and the hip abductors so by understanding the functional anatomy and what points are on what line then it's just going to make your treatment methods and procedures that much smoother that much more competent and that much more effective okay so that's all I have time for right now. I hope that you've enjoyed this and have gotten something from it. If you're going to take just one thing, consider the treatment principle that we spoke of about how you want to reduce the areas of chronic contraction because that will alleviate the pain that's in the antagonistic muscle or in the antagonistic fascial line. And when you know how to correct that chronic contraction either through acupuncture or through showing your clients movements that will help to facilitate better range of motion and um, better balance between the muscle groups then you're going to get much better results for treating all kinds of things not only musculoskeletal conditions and pain but you'll also understand how to get better results with internal medicine as well. And that's a whole topic that I've just briefly touched upon, but many of the principles that you'll learn in the courses and when you really understand these myofascial lines, you can apply a lot of the same teachings and principles to the treatment of internal conditions. And this really just relates to that internal external connection that exists between the organs and the meridians or these myofascial lines. So that's something I cover in detail in my 304 level internal medicine course. So I hope that you've found this valuable and have been able to take something from it. Go out and start using some of the things that I spoke of in this webinar. Start using them immediately. Start mastering them so that you've got a stronger command of the points. And I'm currently offering a sell on my classes as well. And this is one of the deepest discounts I've ever given. You can get three classes essentially for a, the price of two and, and a discount on top of that, or you can get all of my classes. Plus, I've just released a course on somatic therapies as well. So if you're interested in working with emotional conditions and shin disturbance, then I highly recommend this course as well. And if you purchase all of the classes, you can do that and you get that somatic therapy class in there as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this material. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to write me. I enjoyed discussing this and look forward to sharing more. Have a great day. Bye-bye.